that? <laughs> said your ears must be burning. They Not told at all. I did. asked him if we were waiting for Dum Dum to show up. Oh. And Joyce is like, who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. She said you named yourself that. Well, it seems to be uh, temporarily <laughs> appropriate. No, I don't. No, so. I don't think I so. disagree. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to praise and worship you, God. We ask, Lord, that you would be here, that your presence would be here, Lord, that you would fill this place with your holy angels, God. We ask, Lord, that um, you would knit our hearts together in love and joy of you and your kingdom this morning. And we ask, Lord, this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, stand with me. I'm going to sit, but you, you guys got to stand. Except Joyce. Is that you too? We'll say. <laughs> well, you're going to have to sing extra loud today because, like I said, my voice is just mm -hmm. not out there the way it should be today. So, Joy to the world. Yes.
Tak chodí sa mi aj. So, if you have your Bibles, please turn to two places, two places, but they're really close together. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, and we will only be reading verse 14 out of there, and then Isaiah chapter 9 uh, and verses 6 and 7. Would you like the Bible? Okay. Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord will perform, will do this. Let's pray. Dear Father God, Lord, as we come to examine your word, I pray, Lord, that you would reach into our hearts and conform us to what it is you want us to understand this morning. Lord, I pray that we would give you glory today, but during this special time of year, Lord, I pray, God, that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit this morning uh, as I uh, seek to exegete your word properly, Lord. I pray, God, that you would guard this place against the devil and his angels. I pray, God, that you bind them away in the name of Jesus Christ and by his blood, that you fill this place entirely with your spirit, and you fill this place entirely uh, with your angels and with your people, Lord. And I pray, God, uh, that we would be able to give the attention to the word this morning that it deserves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a bit of a rumor in my house. Now, this rumor is not quite as pronounced as it was years ago. I think some of the frost on me has fallen off over the years, but the rumor goes something like this. I don't like Christmas. They will testify to this, that I don't like Christmas. Now, I've said for years that I do like Christmas and that the idea that I don't like Christmas is completely and totally and utterly unfounded. It is just a rumor, but you will hear my wife and my lovely stepdaughter say, I don't like Christmas. Now, it is true that there are aspects of Christmas this season that I don't like. For example, uh, many of the movies that come out during this time of year, I tend not to like. It tend to be the Hallmark movies, <laughs> where it's really just a love story set around the Christmas season. I hate and I, you know, they're so predictable, and I'll watch them, and they just, you know, they, it's on almost the entire day. Or, you know, the cooking challenge kind of things, although I was a little involved in that yesterday, seeing who was going to win with the gingerbread houses. But really, I find it mostly a waste of time. But just because I don't like the, you know, the TV shows that are on doesn't mean I don't like Christmas. Also, I don't like the shopping. That's kind of a drag. You have to be out there with all the crowds and everything that goes on. Um, and you have to fight your way through the crowds to try to find the perfect gift of, of uh, you know, of what it is you think they might like or, you know, the hints that you took over the years or whatever it is that you think that they, uh, over this Christmas year, uh, you know, the thing that they you might think they like, and you got some people who says, oh, I don't want anything. Just don't give me anything. I don't care whatever you get is good. And you go, oh, gosh, what am I going to do in all these crowds? But just because I don't like shopping, and I don't like the movies, and I don't like the TV shows, doesn't mean I don't like Christmas. I also don't like picking the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is a drag, right? I mean, you know, you got to get it in the house, and I, I'm the one who has to lift it, and I get the sap on me and everything, and you have to <laughs> hold it in place and nail it to, but just because I don't like the Christmas tree, and I don't like 
the, the shopping and the crowds and the movies and the propaganda doesn't mean I don't like Christmas. I also don't like hanging Christmas lights. If you come to our house, you'll find that there are no lights that are hung up, okay? I don't like hanging lights because it's just a tedious and you just take them down and we never get around to taking them down and so they're, you know, they're there till April, till Easter. <laughs> but just because I don't like putting up the Christmas tree, hanging lights, shopping, wrapping the gifts and the movies and the propaganda doesn't mean I don't like Christmas. The truth is, is I actually love this time of year. I actually really love this time of year because it means two things. It mean, Well, it means more than two things, I'm sure. But what it means is that on this time of year when Christ was born, it represented, and it, well, it didn't just represent, but it actually began the reversal of the curse. Everything that Adam messed up and everything that we read in our Old Testament up until that point, there's like a point where it breaks. And everything that was messed up begins to become being fixed after Christ. Now, that, that fixing isn't immediate. It's not all at once. And neither was the curse on this world all at once. You know, when, at, when Adam fell and God pronounced a curse, you know, the next day, it, it probably didn't look too different than the previous day. I mean, it took a while for it to... Uh, for it to, you know, fully degenerate down to where we even get to the time of the flood where God has to wipe everything out. And likewise, when Jesus is born, he says that the kingdom of God is now like leaven. A little bit leaven, leavens the whole lump, and it will permeate and go through the entire world. And it also means that this is a, an establishment of the reversal of the curse and an establishment of a new kingdom, a new kingdom, with a new king and a new government. The only problem is, is that we have we're, have, we're establishing this new kingdom in this world that we live in. So, for example, I like to, I've heard it said before, it's like some places in the world you drive on the left-hand side of the road, like America, and in other places of the world you drive on the right-hand side of the road, like now I don't know which is which Australia. is more, Australia and England. Now, same. it's it's is it the same amount same, same amount of places drive on the left hand side of the <laughs> road as the right hand side of the road? Okay, so it would be like the new king comes and he says, okay, now from now on we're not going to drive on the right hand side of the road. We're going to drive on the left hand side of the road. New kingdom, new kingdom laws, new kingdom order. The problem is, is you're driving on the opposite side of the road in a land where everybody's still driving on the other side of the road, okay? So it's a new kingdom, but it's established within a land that is still prevailed by sin. But we know that this kingdom will win out because we know the one who rules this kingdom. And that's what our text is about this morning, the coming of this king who rules this kingdom, the prediction of this king who rules this kingdom. Now, I have two challenges set before me this morning as I begin to unpack these verses. And the first challenge is just the exposition of these verses, because after all, we have to get the meat of the word that we want from these passages out and what it actually means. However, because these passages are so plain and so clear, um, it has been the source of uh, ridicule, not just ridicule, but misinterpretation. Because it says so clearly that this one who comes is going to be born of a virgin, is going to be God Almighty, God and human, you have every, and because it says it so plainly, and it says it many years before it happens, you have your atheists and your cultists attacking this verse. To the point where when you read this verse, unless you read it in a bubble or something like that, when you're, you know, when, in, when you're witnessing and you're bringing up, well, I know why Jesus is God, because it says here he's mighty God. Then you hear somebody say, well, it says God. It says mighty God, not God Almighty. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses say that. 
So it's almost like we read this verse, and then also it says everlasting Father, and the oneness Pentecostals jump on that. See, Jesus is the Father and the Son. And so it's almost like when we read this verse, we have to read it in a way of saying, this is not what it means, this is not what it means, this is not what it means. And in addition to that, it is so rich in what it does mean that I hope this morning you are okay with being Bible scholars, okay? We're going to be doing a little back and forth through the Bible. I know, I know, we, you know, we all don't want to do it, but we're going to do it. Now, the difference is, yeah, we do. I was kidding. We all like doing it. I like doing it as well. So, <laughs> so here, here's the difference between what's normally thought of as the Sunday school and the sermon. Uh, the Sunday school is more like, or the Wednesday night service or whatever, it's more like learning how to cook, okay? You know, it's like bringing you into the kitchen. The Sunday morning is more like giving you the meal, you know, like you, this, is, this is the meal. Um, however, because this verse is so complex and I want you to get the richness out of it, and because it's been attacked by so many different critics, we are this morning going to have to go into the kitchen a little bit and learn how to cook, okay? We're going to have to learn metaphorically, okay? <laughs> I think we all, we all got that. Metaphorically, we are going to dissect this a little bit and look at it and also look at how it relates to other parts of the scripture and why it doesn't say what some of the cults have meant it to say. So that's my twofold um, task this morning. Well, first of all, let's look at the historical setting of this uh, prophecy, both the prophecy in chapter 7 and the prophecy in chapter 9. We are well after the split between the northern and the southern kingdom. And at this time, the northern kingdom to the, no to the north is called Israel, and the southern kingdom is called Judea. And to the north, God sent Hosea, and he sent Amos. Amos first, then Hosea. And to the south, one of the people he sent here was Isaiah. Now, what's happening during this time is that Assyria is becoming to become a world empire, and it is just flooding through the Middle East, conquering lands. And there's two kingdoms that are next. That's Syria, or, or Assyria, sorry. And there's two kingdoms that are next. It is... Uh, it is Syria and Israel. Okay, so you've got Assyria, Syria, and Israel. And Syria and Israel, sometimes Syria is called Damascus because it's the capital city. So Damascus and Israel are worried now that Assyria is going to come and conquer them. They're next. They're next. And so what the king of Damascus and what the king of Israel try to do is go to the king of Judah and say, hey, would you help us out and fight against this because we're going to be next, and then if we're next, then you're going to be next. Um, and the king, Ahaz, at this time, says, no, thank you. You're on your own. And in a backdoor deal, he makes a deal with the king of Assyria mm -hmm. to help conquer Israel and, and Syria, Israel and Damascus. But before he does that, God sends him Isaiah the prophet and says, don't do this. You shouldn't be doing this. You know, go ahead. You're going to be fine. And he says to him, trust the Lord. Give, give, even ask the Lord for a sign. Just ask the Lord for a sign, and he will give it to you. And um, King Ahaz says, nah, I don't want to trouble the Lord with the sign. It's a veiled attempt to look pious. But really what it is, is he just, he says, oh, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't test the Lord. You shouldn't test the Lord. Um, and what it really is, is a veiled way of being pious. And um, God says to him, okay, you won't ask for a sign, but I will give you a sign. Here's the sign. In verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now here we have the first attack on the scripture, because this is predicted 600 years prior to Mary, uh, prior to the birth of Christ, 
the critics, both Jewish and atheistic critics, who don't want to accept Jesus as the Messiah, nor want, wanting to accept the Bible as prophetic, say, well, the term virgin here is inappropriate because the term virgin is Alma in the Hebrew, and it just means, it's more, it means like a young Hebrew girl or something like that, not necessarily a virgin. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do, it should more be translated maiden, is what they'll say. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus being born, it has to do with Isaiah's son being born, right? That's the criticism that you will hear. You have to know these criticisms as well, because I'm sure you all share your faith. And when you share your faith, you tell people about Jesus, and you tell them about the resurrection, and pretty soon they go, hey, that's really interesting. I, I like what you're saying about Jesus, but why should I believe you? So you have to answer why we believe what we believe. We can't just answer what we believe. We have to answer why we believe what we believe. Well, first of all, this is a sign, okay? This is the Hebrew word for miracle. This is the Hebrew word. This is the Hebrew word that gets translated into the Greek word that John uses when Jesus turns water into wine. He said this was his first sign, meaning miracle. And then he goes on later and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He said this was his sign that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he performs these miracles in the book of John. And these are called signs. Signs is equivalent to miracle. There isn't any miracle in a woman having a baby. Okay? That's not a miracle. That's, that's, that, that, that happens all the time. Could you imagine that I go, well, I'm going to show you a sign. A woman's going to have a baby. Like, well, okay, women have babies. That's normally, that's normally, normally what happens. So the second thing is, is that they'll say, well, this term is virgin. It's not virgin, but maiden. But the term maiden means, like when you say a maiden voyage, right? It means it's the first voyage, right? It hasn't gone anywhere yet. However, the Jewish rabbis, when they were translating the Bible from Hebrew into Greek, guess what term they used? Virgin. Virgin. They used the term virgin. So when the atheist or the Jewish person comes and says, oh, this is just about Isaiah's kids. So first of all, Isaiah having children isn't a sign. That's not a miracle. And you're opposed to this being about Christ, but they weren't opposed to this being about Christ because when they translated it, because they translated it as virgin when they translated it into the Greek. They could have chosen the word maiden. They could have chosen the word young girl. They could have chosen any word. But the rabbis, when they translated into Greek, they translated the term of virgin. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And finally, Isaiah's kids weren't God with us. They weren't. They weren't Emmanuel. He's obviously speaking past their uh, understanding into a future time. Turn now to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse, and verse 6, and we get more about this child. Now, verse 8 is kind of a rebuke for uh, um, the king not listening, not listening to um, Isaiah and pulling this backdoor deal with Assyria and some of the consequences that they are going to have to do, do for this. But when we get to this child again who's being prophesied, notice it says, for unto us a child is born. It's not unto Isaiah. It's unto us a child is born. In other words, this child will be human. This child will come into the world in the regular way children come into, into the world. It's not to Isaiah that this child is born. It's unto us, meaning Israel and also meaning the church as it stands, the new Israel as it stands now. But this child is going to be human. He's not going to come in on a jet plane. He's not going to come in with rockets. He's going to come in the regular way children come into this world. He is going to be born. And he's going to be born lowly, in a lowly stable. He's born in a stable because he's born with other sacrificial animals. He is born with sheep, and he is born with goats, and he is born with bulls, 
any form of cows, because he becomes the true sacrifice for Israel. He is born lowly in a stable. For unto us a son is given. Now this represents his divine side. Now don't think about this in the way the Mormon thinks about this, that God's up there. He says, well, I know what a son is, and you know we have sons, and it takes a mommy and a daddy to make a son, and then if he has a son up there, and he was already the son, and he came down here, then he must have a mommy, and no. You're taking what's this, learn, learn this, this phrase. This phrase has helped me out. I learned this from Dr. Bob. Don't take what's metaphorical and make it metaphysical. Don't take what's metaphorical and make it metaphysical. Jesus is also called the door. He's also called the burning furnace. He's also called the light of the world. He's also called, none of all those are metaphorical, but they are, and they mean something. They mean something true, but we don't want to take it. He's not a real door. You don't open him and, you know, walk through. <laughs> he's not a loaf of bread. He's not any of those things. You don't take what's metaphorical and make it metaphysical. What God is trying to do is trying to say, this is like a father and son relationship. The best father and son relationship that you could have on the planet. This is what my relationship with Christ is like. Now, he is not the son, and this is why we say he's not the son that was given by Mary. Mary did not give him to be crucified. God gave his son. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, he was a child to be born, but he was a son to be given. Mary didn't give him up to be crucified. He's a son to be given. And the eternal sonship of God is established in Scripture and elsewhere. Uh, real quickly, turn to uh, Proverbs. This isn't the only time we're going to turn to other places. Um, Proverbs chapter 30 And verse 4, there, I just want to throw this out there because there are many places where it talks about Jesus as the Son prior to his incarnation. Who has, in verse 4, it says, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the winds in his fist? Who has wrapped the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his Son's name? Surely you know. What is his name and what is his son's name? Also in um, uh, Psalms chapter 2, sorry, it escaped me for just a second. It talks about kiss the son or his wrath will abide on you. Okay, so he is a child that's born, but he is a son that's given, carrying the nature of his father with him. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. So he comes to establish this new government, and he comes to establish this, this new government, not in any human power, but in his own power, and it's going to be carried on his shoulders. And now it gives a description of what his name is going to be. Wonderful Counselor. Now this term, wonderful, seems to modify counselor. Sometimes people put wonderful, comma, counselor. That's not necessarily bad to do, but if you look at most of your translations, it's wonderful counselor. Because in Hebrew, it's a little ambiguous, but it <coughs> seems to indicate that wonderful is modifying counselor. So he's a wonderful counselor. Now this name, wonderful, is kind of rich and its Old Testament use, usefulness. Now, we say wonderful, but we need to start at the end. Full of wonder. Full of wonder is what this meant. Turn to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. The parents of Samson... They, huh? Uh, judges? Oh, oh, verse. You said, oh, verse. I thought you said first. Yeah, first judges. <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Verse. Um, uh, 
we're going to go in verse 17, but look down down here a little bit in verse 22. They they saw they saw a, a, a Christology. A, a, sorry, a Christophany. That's the word I'm looking for. They saw a Christophany, and not knowing that when they saw a Christophany, that it, that's okay. That you know you can look at God. You can't look at God unveiled. You'll die. But God can manifest Himself to you in Christophanies, in the angel of the Lord, in um, uh, you know, in the pillar of fire, and things like that. You can get glimpses of God from time to time. But they didn't know that. They thought they were going to die. Look at verse twenty-two. And um, Manoah said to his wife, "We shall surely die, for we have seen God." That's what they were worried about. They were going to die because they had seen God. Now they just didn't know. They didn't understand. They had read Moses, and they had read. No one can see my face and die. And they had read the story about how Moses had to be put in the cleft of the rock and how that, that the Lord went through. And then Moses just turned and looked. It says his backside. But it's, re it's really the, the fleeting glory. That's what he saw, the fleeting glory of God. And he was changed forever. And so they thought, well, obviously, if we saw God, we'll die. Um, but look here in verse 18. Sorry. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Seeing that it is wonderful. So this person who's going to be born, Christ, now in Isaiah, picks up that name. He is the wonderful counselor. Now, everything that follows this, these names that are given, you really have to think of this in terms of uh, Christ's relationship to his kingdom, okay? If you fall off that bandwagon, you'll fall into error. Now, sometimes you'll fall into great error. Sometimes you'll just kind of fall into a little bit stupidity. You know, so I hear the stupidity sometimes. And I've been guilty of it too. But understand the framework of this is, is Christ now in relationship to his kingdom as king. He's the wonderful counselor. Now, this does not mean wonderful therapist. Okay. Now, it's true that he is a wonderful therapist. That's, that's true. But that's not what's being spoken of here. This is a legal term. We still use this legal term today when you seek counsel. In other words, when you're having an issue and you need the counsel of somebody, you need a, a, an advocate. Okay, you need somebody. Now, in those days, they would go to the king for that kind of counsel. You would have a problem. You'd say, this person's here, I'm here, you know, and, you know, we're dividing up a baby or something like that, you know, like Solomon did. They would go for counsel. Well, he's the wonderful counselor, you see. He's the wonderful advocate. He's the one who's never, ever going to get a case wrong, ever. As a matter of fact, not only is he ever going to get a case wrong, He's ne you'll never lose a case, and you're his client. So he plays a double role here. So yes, now, is it, is it true that this bleeds into wonderful therapist? Yeah, because what we need from God as a, as a heavenly king, what we need from Christ as a heavenly king, is for things to be worked out in our hearts and in our lives and things like that. But to, 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 to start there and to leave it there really isn't what this verse is about. Counselor is a legal term. He's a wonderful counselor. The second thing is, is he is mighty God. Now here, the, you know, because it says mighty God, people who don't like to think of Jesus as being God incarnate, incarnate say the most ridiculous things that I have ever heard. And I have heard this many times. When you read this to him, it'll say, he is, he, is God, he is mighty God, but he's not God Almighty. And the Jehovah's Witnesses say this. They'll say that the term mighty God is never used in association to capital, you know, the capital L, capital R, R O, capital R, capital D. He is never used in association with that. It's always God Almighty. So whoever this is, is a lesser type of deity than, uh, than God the Father. Well, these people simply, well, it's, first of all, it's like, okay, who says that the only time that God is going to be called God means God Almighty and not Mighty God? I mean, that's just an arbitrary rule to fix your theology. Second of all, these people lie. <laughs> that's all there is to it. Well, most of them are fooled, but for, they, they lie. 
Turn to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter, and all you got to do is show them this. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 20. But in that day, a remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth, a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Amen. They will return to the mighty God. This also gets into another title of Christ, the Holy One of Israel. Mm -hmm. The Holy One of Israel is being called Jehovah, as they call him, or Yahweh, probably more precisely. The Holy One of Israel is the Lord God, and they will return to the mighty God. So that's how you take care of that nonsense. Well, I wish we were done with the nonsense, because... Another piece of nonsense comes up here. You see, he's the mighty God in relationship to his kingdom. What it means by that is that his authority isn't surpassed. There's no court of appeal higher in his kingdom than him. Now, of course, in the Trinitarian aspect, we understand there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But you're not going to get a different answer from God the Father than you do God the Son, Okay. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on, on earth. Go and make disciples. In this kingdom that Christ established, he is mighty God. You say, oh, well, he's a wonderful counselor, but what if he gives me bad counsel? Is there something else I can appeal to? Nope. No more appeals. He's the mighty God. The next one is everlasting father. Now, I'm sure you've heard some wag from the United Pentecostal Church or uh, some other modalistic church say something like, well, you see, because modalism, we all know what modalism is, right? It's that, that Jesus and the Father are the same person. You know, it's the same person. It's like he's wearing a mask. You know, he wore the mask of the Father in the Old Testament. He takes off the mask. He wears the mask of the Son in the New Testament. He takes off the mask and he wears the mask of the Holy Spirit in the uh, in the church age that's that's a modalistic idea it's not trinitarian um and they will appeal to they will try to appeal to this verse uh, i had a friend one time we were arguing about the validity of whether or not uh the united pentecostal church was mo was um was heretical and he said well you know, it's wrong, but at least they've got that one verse. And he pointed to this verse, Everlasting Father. I said, no, no, look, there are no, there are no verses that prove bad theology, okay? There are no verse. it's not like God was up there and, you know, he's, he's like, well, I'm a Calvinist, so I've got to make sure that there's some bad verses in the Bible so people can have heresy. You know, so let, <laughs> let me give you some bad verses. No. There are no bad <laughs> verses in the Bible. There aren't any verses that prove heresy. There are verses that are misused. Again, remember that this is Christ in his relationship to his kingdom, not Christ in his relationship to the Trinity. And as his relationship to his kingdom, he is everlasting father, meaning he is everlasting father protector and provider Amen. that's what the, the term father in the context means it's not christ in relationship to the trinity it's christ in relationship to his kingdom he is the everlasting father he is the everlasting what father meant provider and protector Amen. and then he is the prince of peace he is the prince of peace and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore and by the zeal of the lord he will perform this now you must think about this this is one of the reasons why i believe the bible is absolutely the word of god it is because of what Jesus said in using this in Matthew chapter 24. 
a lot of stuff about the end times and Matthew 24, we can debate all that. But one of the things he said is that the gospel of this kingdom shall go out to the entire world. It would never stop. See, the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David to establish it and uphold it. So when's that happen? Well, we know when that will happen, right? I mean, we know when this happens. Look here, it says, On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Now this is not the only place, this is not the only place in the Old Testament where the throne of David is prophesied, okay? The reestablished throne of David is prophesied. There are other places, and I don't have time to go to all those other places, but we do have time to go and look at how the Bible talks about this. Okay. Look at uh, verse 25 of Acts chapter 2. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, and uh, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon you, my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make full gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he should be seated on his descendant's throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Okay? <laughs> Good words get any plainer. The Davidic throne fulfillment is fulfilled according to Peter in the resurrection of Christ. He foresaw this and spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. And Jesus said that the, that the gospel of his kingdom will go out over the whole world and the increase of this kingdom there will be no end. Now, furthermore, how do we know when this exactly happened? Look up here in chapter in Isaiah chapter uh, nine in verse in verse one and following, because we're really kind of picking it up here in a couple different places in the story. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time since. He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And in the latter time, he, he has made glorious the way and the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, Galilee was to the north. And the reason why it's called Galilee of the nations or Galilee of the Gentiles is because the northern border was kind of kind of like you get up north and kind of like our southern border. You know, you don't know where Mexico starts. Yeah, right. and, and, it was kind of like that up there in the north. It was like there's Jews, but there's also Gentiles. And of course, you go so far, and it's all Gentiles, but you go far, and there's this mix. This is why it was called Galilee of the nations. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the deep darkness, on them has a light shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. The, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulders and the rod of his oppressor you have broken on the day of Midian. For every root of the trampling of the warrior in battle uh, tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Then we get into this the rest of what's being said here. Now look. Here we go. I do apologize. Yes. Look at. Merry Christmas, man. Look at um, Matthew chapter four. Now turn to Matthew chapter four. Acts 
after his temptation wondering, after his baptism. And look at verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and the living and the and leaving uh, Nazareth and went and lived in Capernaum by the sea and the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali the way of the sea beyond the Jordan the Galilee of the Gentiles the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death on them light has dawned. Now, there's no question that when Jesus comes, came that first time that he came to establish this, this kingdom. And he's going to do this. This is secure that he is going to do this. He's going to reign with justice. He's going to reign with righteousness from that time forevermore. And we know he's going to do this because it says the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall shall perform this now before we end a few words of admonition the christian life is this verse being lived out you must learn that the government is on christ's shoulders and because it's on christ's shoulders he carries you you don't carry the messiah if you carry the Messiah, you carry a Messiah that you made, and you carry him uh, in idolatry. You don't carry the Messiah on your shoulders. He carries you on his shoulders. And the reason for this is, is that your hands are too full. Your hands are too full. They're too full, and they're too sinful, and they're too messy. You've got enough on your plate. You've got... You see, you got enough on your plate, you got enough to worry about, and you're thinking, okay, now I gotta carry the Messiah too. But your hands being full, and your hands being sinful, and your hands being messy have nothing to do with the power of Christ to carry you. Amen. The government isn't upon his, uh, isn't upon your shoulders, it's upon his shoulders. Second thing is that this kingdom is a strange kingdom. It is not worldly, as Jesus said. It's not worldly when it comes to force, and it's not worldly when it comes to wisdom. This kingdom came not by force. This kingdom came in a child born in a manger, born lowly. That's not wise in our eyes. We don't think that. We don't think that's force. We don't think that's wise. If I would have done it, I would have done it differently. I would have had to come down out of heaven. You know, I did all that stuff. That's not what we think as wisdom when we want to establish a kingdom. Furthermore, it is not worldly wisdom when he went to the cross. He came as a baby, helpless, no authority, poor. This is the king? Well, that's not wise. Is that wisdom? Not worldly wisdom. And he bought this kingdom at the price of his own blood on the cross. Nobody was looking at Jesus in the manger, and no one was looking at Jesus on the cross and thinking, oh, on the cross, that's where we're going to get it, right? Okay, that's the best part. They weren't thinking that. You see, it wasn't born out of worldly wisdom. And even after his resurrection, still not what we're thinking. This, is, this, is this the time you're going to restore Israel? That's, you know, wisdom... Our wisdom would have been, yeah, great, you know, you're going to establish a kingdom. now. Okay, we get it. You had to die. Now you rose again from the dead. And now you're here, right? You're here. No, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave you the spirit, and you're going to establish the kingdom. I'm going to consummate the kingdom, but you're going to establish the kingdom. You see, it's not what we would think in our minds if we were writing this from scratch, going, I'm going to establish a kingdom. I'm going to make a kingdom. He's going to be great. We would have done it so much differently. And as subjects of his kingdom, don't be afraid when he draws you into deep waters that you don't quite understand. Don't be afraid. He's establishing his kingdom. The wisdom that he has 
is beyond our wisdom, and we don't understand why he does what he does. It's said, and I say this with you know knowing what's going on in our in our lives right now, but it is said that uh, an artist can take like a cup and he can make it look just like a real glass of water, make it look just like a real glass of water. You you couldn't tell the difference until you hit it. And when you hit it, what's inside comes out. And we can look like Christians, we can look just like Christians from the outside until trials come, mm -hmm. until the trials come. But we must trust the king and realize that there's a pattern here, that he's not doing things the way we think that he should be doing them. But every mm -hmm. time he does it, it works out. Mm -hmm. Why do I like Christmas? Well, because... When Jesus came the first time, it proved that he is going to come the second time. It proved that he is wise and he is going to come and establish and, and consummate and establish his kingdom forevermore. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for um, your kingship. We thank you for this time of year when we recognize that you came in a stable but you came, Lord, to reverse everything that Adam messed up and that we mess up continually. And that one day you are returning for sure. Because you came the first time, you will come again. Help us to look forward to that day. Help us not to put our hope in this world, but to put our hope in the age to come. Amen. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you want to stand, you can stand. If you don't, you can stay seated. <laughs> These last two songs, What Child Is This? It's a, it's a really great song in the sense of what Ian just preached about and who Christ really is. And then we have a bigger picture of who he is. And, and you know, we think about this song and we think, you know, this little baby laying in the manger, I mean, who is he? You know, we don't, now we really understand who he is.
opportunity that we've had to share um, in your word and in worship, God. We just ask, Lord, that you be blessed. We thank you for the food. We ask that you bless it in our conversation. We just say this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have a question for you guys about this last song. Okay. I like to break it up. So that they, they, I know that.